The Sands of Redvale, Part 4. Aiden had never been so amazed by Isabella in all of his life. Did she just... The Sands of Redvale, Part 4. Aiden had never been so amazed by Isabella in all of his life. She just did a nearly perfect dismount over a bottomless pit. How incredible was that? Thanks to you, Isabella, we now have the scripture key, Malachi said as Isabella handed it to him. He held the key high and sunlight glimmered on gold. Let me insert the key into the sandbox, Red said, hopping up and down, trying to snag it from Malachi's hands. Remember, the key doesn't work unless you all do it together. Aiden, Isabella, and Emily. And me, Red said. Yes, you can help too, said Malachi, but since Isabella retrieved the key, let her begin. Malachi handed the key back to Isabella. Then the three kids put their hands together and Red topped it off with his paw. Altogether, they inserted the key into the sandbox and turned it. Click! What a sweet sound, Red said. Two keys down, three to go. Do I get the, to fetch the next one? Patience, Red. The next mission has been given to Aiden. Aiden was hoping he'd say that. But now that Malachi actually spoke his name out loud, nervousness crept over him like so many spiders. Isabella had performed mar marvelously, but what if he failed in his mission? It would be really embarrassing. Everything was a contest to Aiden. He hated losing whenever they played Monopoly, video games, tag, running, swimming, you name it. So it made him feel a little sick, just thinking that Isabella would succeed in her mission and he might not. Before we head off for the next key, tell us about this flag, Emily said. The flag where Isabella had found the scripture key carried the picture of a Bible and a knife. I know this one, piped up Melchior. That's the flag of the disciple Bartholomew because he put great faith in scripture. He was also killed with a knife. That was our fourth flag, Isabella said, counting them on her fingers. Eight to go. Let's move. Onward and upward, said Malachi, holding up the big wilderness guidebook. Six more pages have turned to sandpaper, so there's no time to lose. They continued their trek north, eventually coming across the fifth flag before setting up their tents for the night. This was the flag of Andrew, and it had the picture of two fish and an X-shaped cross. The disciple Andrew, like his brother Peter, was once a fisherman and became a fisher of men for Jesus. He was killed on an X-shaped cross. That's why Scotland has a white X against a blue background on its national flag, Malachi pointed out. Soon the sun began to set, creating fireworks of yellow, orange, and fiery red on the western horizon. As night set in, they sat around the campfire, eating cheese sandwiches, apples, and figs, while Isabella described what it was like walking the balance beam past the sand badgers. Aiden didn't say much, partly because he was growing ever more nervous, and partly because he was getting more and more jealous of his older sister. He was starting to panic. Later that night, when everybody was asleep, Aiden lay on his back, staring at the roof of the tent his mind still buzzing with worries. Malachi suddenly whispered through the tent flap, Come, Aiden, it's time for us to talk. Melchior was snoring as Aiden slipped out of his tent and passed the camel. He found a seat in the sand by the fire. Malachi sat opposite him, poking at the flames, and sparks flew upward into the star-filled sky. Aiden had never seen so many stars before. There had to be gazillions sweeping from horizon to horizon. You don't play the trumpet anymore, do you, Aiden? Melchior said, breaking the silence. Nah. Why'd you quit? Just got bored. Are you sure that was it? Aiden had a hunch that Mal Malachi knew the real reason he gave up the trumpet. It wasn't just boredom. Emily had become good on the piano, and Isabella was incredible on the violin. When Aiden realized he could never beat them at playing musical instruments, he gave up the trumpet. But he didn't say any of this. He just shrugged. Since your last visit to Redvale, I've been pleased that you've continued your servant ways, Malachi said, mer mercifully changing the subject. Until the lockdown, you continued to teach Goggles how to play baseball, and the other boys now accept him. Aiden grinned. Being praised was like feasting on a big bowl of ice cream. You've developed the heart of a servant, but you've neglected one area of being like Jesus. Do you know what that might be? Aiden shrugged. Beats me. You're a boy of action. You like to serve because it means doing things for others. You're a doer, and that's good, but you also need to stop sometimes and pray. Aiden scowled. He didn't take criticism easily. Do you agree, Aiden? Do you think you need to learn to pray more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we talk about something else now? This is important for you to hear before your mission tomorrow. What's prayer got to do with my mission? Everything. Tomorrow, you will be in a battle. A battle? Like, a real battle? Will I have a weapon? A lightsaber, maybe? 
Your weapon will be the sword of the spirit, Malachi said. Aiden's heart sank. Oh, I thought maybe I'd get a real sword. The sword of the spirit is as real as you get. Tomorrow, your mission is to retrieve the prayer key from a flag that will be at the center of a big battle. And how will I get to the flag if I don't have a weapon? By listening, Malachi said. Listening for what? You'll find out. Just let me offer one piece of advice. Be snared by prayer. Be snared by prayer? What's that supposed to mean? You'll figure it out. If you truly listen, prayer is not just about telling God what you want him to do. It's about listening to him. So, be snared by prayer. As Malachi stood and made a move to go back to his tent, Aiden became desperate for answers. Do you mean God is going to talk to me on the battlefield? God is always talking to us, wherever we are. But, hold on, how will I know he's speaking? I don't get it. Good night, Aiden. Remember, prayer can change things. It can even change you. Aiden went to sleep feeling more confused and nervous than ever. Snared by prayer? Why in the world did Malachi have to be so mysterious? The next morning, following breakfast, they broke camp and left while the air was still relatively cool. After an hour of traveling up and down the sand dunes, Aiden saw a distant flag flapping in a valley between two large dunes. He also saw soldiers, lots of soldiers, two entire armies. One army was positioned on a sand dune to the right of the flag, and the other army had gathered on a dune to the left. When Malachi spotted the soldiers, he motioned for everyone to get down, including Melchior. They lay on their stomachs, peering down from a high dune. One of the armies was dressed in all red, while the other army wore green uniforms. There had to be a thousand or more soldiers, some of them sitting atop camels. But here's the truly strange thing. They all seemed to be carrying musical instruments, trombones, trumpets, tubas, and piccolos. The craziest instrument of all was what looked like a monstrous horn-shaped cannon on wheels. Are those armies or marching bands? Isabella asked. Both, said Malachi. The destroyers control the minds of everyone in these marching bands. They've been turned into enemy armies fighting over the flag and preventing anyone from reaching it. A marching band army? Aiden asked. That doesn't seem scary. Maybe his mission wasn't going to be so difficult after all. How does an army attack with a trombone? Emily asked. You'd be surprised. They call them sandblasters for a reason. This is ridiculous, Red said. The key is right in front of us. I'm marching down there and grabbing it. No, Red, I wouldn't. Once again, the fox was too fast. He sprinted down the dune, bounding straight for the flag. Thousands of soldiers turned to look at the strange red fox rushing, rushing across the sand. I didn't have a chance to tell him, Malachi said. Whenever someone walks between the two armies, that triggers them into action. Sure enough, just when red was squarely between the two armies, someone shouted, Charge! Then, when someone on the other side bellowed, Charge! The two sides swarmed down the dunes, with red caught in the middle. As the two armies closed in on each other, soldiers began firing their musical instruments, blasting streams of sand from tubas and trombones. The instruments made off-tune sounds as they shot out sand, tons of it flying in every direction. Okay, now I see why they're, why they're called sand blasters, said Emily. Red vanished in a massive cloud of swirling sand as the two armies crashed into each other. You're up, Malachi said, turning to Aiden. Time for you to be a hero. Hop on my back, Melchior said, and Aiden looked at Malachi to see if it was okay. When Malachi nodded, they discontinued Mel. They disconnected Malkior's sled, which carried the sandbox. Then Aiden took off his backpack, leapt onto the camel, and shouted, Charge! Together, they raced down the, du down the dune toward the enemies below. Aiden and Melchior were an army of two versus thousands. Aiden still couldn't believe the soldiers were firing streams of sand from their trombones, tumbas, and trumpets. It was weird, but also kind of cool. If his trumpet back at home shot sh had shot sand, maybe he'd still be playing it. Even the piccolo players fired thin streams of sand like shooting darts up from a blowgun. Every so often, the trumpet cannons would fire, sending a huge ball of sand into a cluster of soldiers, knocking them flat and burying them. The sand flew every which way, and it was so thick that Aiden could no longer see the flag, or red. In moments, they were in the heart of the madness, without a way to defend themselves. In the whirling sand, Aiden could see only a few feet to either side. Soldiers on both sides fired on them. When he turned to his left, a clump of sand hit him squarely in the face, nearly knocking him off Melchior's back. His ears were ringing, and he spit out sand. You all right? Melchior asked. I'm fine, but I don't see how we're going to find the flag in this craziness. Are you still going in the right direction? To be honest, I have no idea, Melchior said. I was hoping you did. 
Incoming! Someone shouted. Aiden looked up to see a huge ball of sand, probably three feet in diameter, arcing across the sky and falling, falling right, to, right toward them. Melchior spurred forward just in time. The sand cannonball landed with a woof directly behind them, burying one of the soldiers. Do you hear that? Aiden asked. Hear what? A drum. I don't remember seeing any soldiers carrying drums, but I hear it. Do you? I do, said Melchior. When soldiers play drums in battle, they're usually sending signals. Do you think the snare drum is sending a signal? Aiden shot up straight in the saddle. What did you just call the drum? A snare drum, the kind of drum soldiers carry into battle. The words slowly sunk in. Malachi told me to be snared by prayer. The, the camel gave that some thought. I think he means you should start praying. But maybe he also wants me to follow the sound of the snare drum. Probably you should do both. Start praying, and I'll try to follow the sound. Dear Lord, Aiden began, but then he stopped. What are you waiting for, Malchior said. The drum is sounding fainter. But Aiden was out of practice in prayer. After dear Lord, what do you say? Prayer is just talking to God. Just talk like you would with me, said Malchior. All right, here it goes. Aiden was so distracted by the battle raging everywhere that he couldn't think straight. I can't hear the drum any longer, Melchior said. Start praying. Finally, he sputtered to a start. Hello, God, this is Aiden. We could really use your help about now. We're caught in a battle with sand flying all around, and we can't hardly see a thing, let alone the flag. He paused. Off in the distance, the drum began playing again, even louder than before. Dear Jesus, also help us find Red. He got caught in the middle of this battle, and I'm afraid he's buried somewhere. The drumbeat picked up, increasing in volume. It seemed to be coming from their right. Lord, I know I haven't talked to you much these days, and I'm really sorry. I would say I've been too busy, but you know that's not true. We've been stuck, stuck inside because of this virus thing. You'd think I'd have tons of time to talk with you. We're getting closer, Mel said Melchior. Keep it up, Aiden. And speaking of the virus, I also pray for our country and the world. It's such a mess. Things seem to be crumbling apart, and we need you. The drumbeat picked up pace, growing yep, ever louder. I also thank you, Lord, for bringing us to Red Vale again, and for bringing us back together with friends like Melchior. As Melchior turned to the left, fo following the sound of the drum, the battle increased in intensity. The flying sand was so thick that Aiden couldn't see but a few feet in front of him. The off-tune tuba sound like, sounded like foghorn blasts. Aiden began to shout his prayer. Lord, please help us find Red wherever he is. Please lead us to the flag. Please help us! Suddenly, the veil of sand parted, like opening a curtain. There, not far away, was the flag. The flag wasn't being guarded, so this was their chance to snatch the key. They were going to make it. He was going to succeed. Then, help me, called a familiar voice. Aiden shot a look to his left and saw Red, buried in sand up to his shoulders. Even worse, three soldiers were preparing to fire their sand blasters at the little fox. They aimed their trumpets, trumpets and let loose a whoosh of sand. Red was completely buried. He was gone, vanished. Aiden saw his chance to grab the key while the flag was still unguarded. He had to act fast. On the other hand, he couldn't just ignore Red. The little fox was buried. He needed Aiden's help now. What if Red couldn't breathe underneath all that sand? If Aiden went for the key, would he doom his friend? What do we do, Melchior said. Aiden groaned at the misery of his decision. He had to get the key. Isabella succeeded in her mission. If he failed because of Red, Aiden, he was confused and angry. Lead me to Red, Aiden said, tugging on Melchior's reins. Quickly. Melchior wheeled around. When they reached the spot where Red had disappeared, Aiden leapt from the camel's back and began digging frantically. Please, Lord, let Red be safe. Help me find him. Melchior used his big feet to help dig. But where was Red? Why weren't they finding him? How deep was he buried? What are you looking for? Came a voice from behind. Can I help? I'm trying to save my friend Red. Aw, that's so nice of you, Aiden. But you're digging in the wrong pile of sand. I was buried back here. But it's the thought that counts. Aiden whirled around. Red was standing right behind them, calmly watching them dig. Aiden wrapped the fox in a huge hug. I'm so happy you're safe. So am I. But don't you think we need to be grabbing that key? Red said, motioning toward the flag. Uh, that's going to be a problem, Melchior said. By this time, the soldiers were guarding the flag, and they aimed a trumpet cannon directly at them. Oh, no, you don't, Aiden shouted, hopping onto Melchior's back. Charge! The camel took off, hurtling straight for the flag and the cannon. If they fired that thing, it was going to really hurt, Aiden thought. Ready, aim, 
the sol soldiers shouted. Melchior was in full sprint now, closing into the in on the flag and the cannon. Fire! Ba-boom! Aiden braced himself for the crushing blow of the sand cannonball. But he didn't feel a thing. Red had run ahead, and he pushed the cannon upward just before it went off. The sand cannonball flew inches above Aiden's head, ruffling his hair as it whipped past. With Melchior in full gallop, Aiden leaned down as they raced toward the flag, the soldiers scattering in their path. Leaning over even more, he snacked the key as they rushed past the flag, and then he lost his balance and tumbled off. Aiden did some somersaults down the dune, head over heels, terrified that the key had been flung out of his hand. Please, Lord, I pray I didn't lose the key, he said as he lay sprawled on the ground. He gasped for breath and slowly sat up. Then he opened his clenched fist. The key was gone! Looking for this, said Red, standing beside him. The key flew from your hand, but I'm a pretty good catch if I have to say so myself. Red had the key in his paw. Meanwhile, all had gone silent. The moment they snagged the key, the fighting stopped. Shaking the sand from his hair, Aiden got to his feet. All of the soldiers were standing around, looking stunned, as if they had just awakened from a dream. They stood in a daze for a good minute, staring at the musical instruments in their hands, as if they didn't know what to do with them. Suddenly, one of the soldiers in red and one of the soldiers in green put the trumpets to their lips, and they began to play together. It was a beautiful melody, and it carried across the vast desert. Then, all of the other soldiers remembered what their instruments were made to do, and they too began to play. A great chorus rang to the heavens. Aiden put Red on his shoulders as Melchior, Malachi, and his sisters came running up to them, big smiles all around. They listened in awe to the music, and when the playing died down, one of the trumpeters walked directly up to Aiden. Thank you for bringing our music back to life, the soldier said to Aiden. Here, I'd like to give you this. The soldier held out his trumpet. Aiden was flabbergasted. Oh, I couldn't take your trumpet. You need it. I think you need it more than I do, the musician said. I have a hunch it's going to come in handy. Are you sure? I couldn't be more sure. Aiden took the trumpet and ran his hand across the polished brass. Then he raised the trumpet to his mouth and played. He'd never sounded better in his life. Day 20, a step in the right direction. Today, there are thousands of treasure hunters all around the world, and not a single one of them has a parrot perched on their shoulder or an eye patch. Most probably wear jeans and a t-shirt. They're called geocachers. It all started back in 2000 when a man from Portland, Oregon decided to partially bury a five gallon bucket about one mile from his house. Inside the bucket was a treasure of videos, books, software, money, a can of beans, and a slingshot. The goal was for people to locate his treasure using their GPS, the global positioning system. Since then, geocaching has become a worldwide craze. Treasures are hidden at GPS coordinates all over the world. For instance, the coordinates might look something like this, 28.822133-81.622633. People plug those coordinates into their phone or GPS device and off they go. The coordinates get them close to the treasure, but not to the exact spot. They still have to do some searching. Day 21, first response or last resort. Dissection is when you take something apart, like a clock, to find out how it works. We're going to dissect your typical day to find out what makes it tick. For starters, what is the very first thing you did this morning after brushing your teeth and going to the bathroom? Write it out below or draw a picture of what you did. Day 22, how you should pray. Just pray it. Below are some famous slogans, but they're missing some keywords. Fill in the blanks, or quiz your mom and dad or friend to see how well they do. Slogans are short, catchy phrases used to help people remember a business. The word slogan comes from Scotland, and it means army, slaw, and shout, gairn. When people are working for a common goal, an army shout gets everyone together. It makes you feel like you're on the same team. Day 23. Practice prayer. Sometimes it seems as if parents have a secret language all their own. Parents across the country say the same kinds of things as to their kids over and over. Color in the bubbles of the phrases you've heard an adult say. Day 24, pause for praise. Imagine the greatest gift in the world. This might be a gift you actually received or something you'd really, really like to get. 
in the gift box below, draw this present or write it down. Day 25, prayer changes things. In the story of Aladdin, a young street urchin stumbles upon a magic lamp and discovers a powerful, fun-loving genie inside. When, Alad when Aladdin rubs, rubs the lamp, the genie pops out and grants him three wishes. Sometimes we treat God like he too is a genie in a lamp. We pray only when we're in trouble. When we pray, we only ask him for things we need. We forget to praise or thank him for what we already have. God also isn't a vending machine. We can't put in a prayer like a quarter in a vending machine and expect our wish to pop, to pop out. God controls everything in the universe, and he knows everything that's going, on, going to happen. But does that mean he is just a good luck charm or a wish granter? For instance, if we don't want our family to move, or if we want the weather to change so our tournament isn't rained out, can our prayers change these things? That was the question faced by a girl named Marin. Day 26, Persistent Prayer. We don't like to wait for things. Look at the brand names below and write down what you use these services to get. Maybe you were trying to find information or maybe you were ordering food. Write down how long it took for you to get something from these services. Finally, if you got something quickly, put a check mark next to the brand name.